reviewed how the concept or the idea of a limbic system actually evolved. We now think of it as this huge mega system with many individual subsystems that are integrative in nature and provide this umbrella to our experience, add this emotional texture to our experience. We also talked about some of the very famous cases, clinical cases in neuroscience, that led us to an understanding of the system. One was, of course, Phineas Gage, very tragic case of an individual who had a 13-pound tamping iron through the front part of his brain. What was significant, again, is that at the time it wasn't recognized that this really had relevance to the localization of function in the brain. So Gage was no longer Gage after this tamping iron went through his prefrontal lobes. And not only had his personality changed, but he no longer had a moral code that could guide his actions. And the reason for this is because we now know that this orbital frontal region, which is right above the orbit of the eye, is specifically able to abstract the cultural rules or mores from whatever culture you're exposed to. So you remember when we talked about language, we talked about how some areas of the left hemisphere seem to be specifically involved in the ability to understand phonemes in a language, to understand them. Well, this area of the brain abstracts rules as well. That's what it does. So whatever culture you're exposed to, those are the rules that your brain will abstract. So what subculture you're exposed to makes a difference. And so this area of the brain is specifically uh, made to do that, so to speak. And so this is the area of the brain that was damaged in Gage. He could no longer use his moral system. He could reason through what a moral was, but he couldn't use that system to guide his actions. And our last case that we looked at was also H.M., another very, very tragic case of an individual who, to keep him from having uh, seizures, had a bilateral medial temporal lobectomy. And what happened was the hippocampus and these other structures that are critically involved in short-term memory and learning in particular were removed bilaterally in this individual. And so from that point on, he was no longer able to learn new material and, in fact, has been followed for at least four decades and has been unable to learn new material. Another very important thing about H.M. is his IQ was not changed. He had an IQ of about 117 before the surgery, and he still has an IQ of 117. His attention span wasn't changed. What changed specifically in him is that he can no longer learn new material. And so everything that he faces in his life is a new event, a new happening. So what is our definition of the limbic system in the modern neuroscience era? It's this huge, mega integrative system of complexly interconnected nuclei that play a role in learning, memory, emotion, and executive function. And now you're beginning to see why I place executive function in that limbic system. So just to review a little bit of the anatomy and remind you of the structures, some of which we're going to talk about, we have, here's our hippocampus. Now it really is part of the temporal lobe, so this is a view through the brain stem. This is the hippocampus. This is one of the structures that was removed in HM. This is the ventral tegmental area, and its projections up here to nucleus accumbens and to this prefrontal cortex we're going to see is going to be involved in addictions. We have an amygdala down here, and the amygdala being very critically involved in the processing of emotions. And in particular, most work has focused on fear. And we're going to have a specific lecture devoted to that. Now, these are only a few of the areas. There are a huge number of nuclei involved in the limbic system. And all of them are organized into these circuits where there's a constant feedback and those smaller circuits are connected to more structures. And so there's this sort of hierarchy of connections. And that's one of the reasons it's been difficult to study and probably took a long time to be recognized as a system because, in fact, it's so complexly interconnected. Now, 
each of these pathways, each of these nuclei in its projection are going to use particular neurotransmitters. That isn't going to surprise you. And just like we saw in the extrapyramidal motor system, this is going to turn out to be important functionally. So what did we see in the extrapyramidal motor system? Remember, that was a system that's involved in like habitual movements, motor programs that get set, in, set into play. And what we saw was that there were many circuits, feedback circuits, and if you removed any one nucleus in that circuit, or you removed one neurotransmitter from that circuit because of damage, you could have incredibly different types of malfunction or lack of function. So for example, the examples we gave at the time, if you lesion the subthalamic nucleus, which is one tiny little nucleus in the extrapyramidal motor system, you get hemibolismus. So if you damage the subthalamic nucleus on one side, you have abnormal motor movements that are ballistic that the person cannot control. If you, on the other hand, damage the substantia nigra in the midbrain, these dopaminergic cells that are in the midbrain that project forward in the brain, what happens is you remove dopamine from a critical circuit. So now you remove from the degeneration of that one nucleus, you remove a major neurotransmitter. And the, what happens there? Parkinsonian signs and symptoms. So initially, the tremor at rest, the abnormal postures, and over time, a freezing of behavior. The reason I bring up the extrapyramidal motor system here while we're talking about the limbic system is because the same kind of idea is going to happen here in the limbic system. You have these complex feedback circuits, this mega system that's set up that's made up of all these different nuclei and the connections between them. If you damage one of the nuclei, you remove it from its circuit and from the bigger circuit. If you do something that changes the neurotransmitters between these nuclei, you're also going to change function. So what happens? Let's step back again and go back to something that was said very early in the course. What happens is that you disrupt the balance of excitation and inhibition. And when you disrupt that balance of excitation inhibition in these pathways, then you have syndromes that result as a consequence of that. In the extrapyramidal motor system, it would be motor signs and symptoms. So here in our limbic system, what you see are profound changes in the way the person relates emotionally or relates to the world. Remember, that's part of what the limbic system does. It's the system that allows us to engage with the world. And so whenever you have any kind of damage, whether it's to a nucleus, a pathway, or you change the neurotransmitters between these, path, between these nuclei, you're going to have a disruption of the system. These imbalances are, in fact, believed to underlie most of the so-called mental or psychiatric disorders that afflict human beings. And in this course, we will use depression as an example of a system in which the balance of neurotransmitters is disrupted. So what we want to do in this lecture is to talk about some of the neurotransmitters and molecules that are used, because these are the ones that get disrupted under certain conditions if you have damage to a nucleus. So it doesn't mean, you know, that that this is the nucleus that's only nucleus for depression, for example. What it means is you remove it from a complicated circuit. And that throwing off of the balance is what results in a subjective experience of depression that the person relates to the physician. So before we can do that, before we can talk about neurotransmitters in the limbic system, we have to talk about our other integrative system in the brain. And we've talked about it before, and that's the reticular formation. And the reticular formation is that other integrative system. And just to remind you, it's a core of nuclei. It's about the, actually the size of my finger of about 110 or more nuclei that extend from the lower part of the medulla up into the forebrain. 
So it's like a column of cells that are divided into individual nuclear areas. When we spoke about it before, however, we spoke about it in the context of it being involved in vital functions like breathing and heart rate. Those are pretty vital. And what we did was use an example that many of the nuclei of the reticular formation that are involved in vital functions like breathing are located in the medulla. And so we talked about how if you have a brain tumor up here or you have a hemorrhagic bleed, there's space taken up here and it forces the brain down. And that causes the brain to herniate and forces the brain down through the hole that connects the medulla with the spinal cord, and that squeezes the area where there's nuclei, which are involved in breathing, heart rate, these vital functions are located. And that's why the person dies. So when the brain herniates like that, you, you basically compromise the function of these nuclei in the reticular formation. Now, but the reticular formation has 110 nuclei in it, so those are only a few of them. So in the context here in the limbic system, other nuclei of the reticular formation that are located more rostrally are involved in functions that are going to be very important for limbic system function. For example, nuclei in the reticular formation regulate sleep, arousal, attention, and even consciousness. Well, it's obvious that all of those things are going to be complexly interrelated with functions of the limbic system like learning and memory or even our emotions. I always give an example to students and I think it's a very good example. If you want to see how the limbic system and the reticular formation are complexly interconnected, you have only to think about how your mood changes when you don't get any sleep. These systems are not only complex in and of themselves. They are complexly interconnected with one another. So in the context of what we're talking about here and the importance of that for our discussion here, it isn't just about the neurotransmitter that one limbic system nucleus uses in its projection to another limbic system nucleus that matters. It's also about the reticular formation nuclei that project the limbic system structures. And so these are all tied up with each other because the two systems are tied up with each other. So some of the nuclei, some of the neurotransmitters we'll talk about will be transmitters of reticular formation projections to limbic system structures. And again, Just think about how your mood changes when you don't get any sleep and you see how these systems are related to each other. So what neurotransmitters are involved? Well, our list looks pretty similar to uh, other lists we've seen for other systems that we've talked about. For example, glutamate. Glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the nervous system in human beings, in the central nervous system. And so we're going to see many of the connections in the limbic system use glutamate. Many of the connections, for example, between the hippocampus, entorhinal cortex, many of these projections are excitatory and they use glutamate. So they can be involved, again, in stroke foci, that penumbral region that can develop. Um, glutamate is a key player in seizures, And the limbic system has the lowest threshold for seizures of any system in the brain. And part of the reason for that is because it has so many glutamatergic uh, synapses. The next one is uh, after glutamate is serotonin. And serotonin is also called 5-HT. Serotonin is one of the monoamines. So it's one of those neuromodulators, one of the monoamines utilized primarily by nuclei which are in the reticular formation. And Raffae nuclei are particularly small groups of neurons that utilize serotonin as a neurotransmitter that are in the reticular formation extending from medulla to midbrain. So there's these tiny little collections of cells that make up little teeny nuclei that have widespread projections to limbic system structures. This is the system 
when there's a disruption of these projections from these raphane nuclei using serotonin to limbic system structures, depression results. So these tiny little nuclei have incredible consequences in human beings when something goes wrong. The next neurotransmitter, which is going to be a major neurotransmitter in the system, is dopamine. It's used by that ventral tegmental area, which is part of the midbrain. Dopamine is going to be a major player in addictions, for example. The ventral tegmental area being that small group of dopaminergic neurons that have widespread projections again to the cortex. And that's going to be actually a subject of one of our lectures. Another neurotransmitter that's used in the system is norepinephrine. Along with dopamine, norepinephrine and dopamine, you remember, are the catecholamines. And they're both part of this monoaminergic projections in the brain. So norepinephrine, which is one of these catecholamines and also called um, a monoamine, is used predominantly by a nucleus of the reticular formation again called the nucleus locus ceruleus. And the nucleus locus ceruleus, that means blue nucleus, is a tiny little nucleus in the pontine region of the brainstem in that reticular core, tiny little group of neurons that have widespread projections to limbic system structures as well as other structures. Now, this tiny group of neurons plays a role in selective attention, the regulation of blood flow in the brain, and sleep-wake cycles. A tiny little nucleus and its projections. So now you see that anything that would disrupt that would obviously disrupt behavior and disrupt an individual's personality. Another neurotransmitter, obviously, is going to be GABA. GABA is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. So you have that balance between glutamate and GABA in general. Then you have these other modulators. And the GABA is particularly a neurotransmitter which is used in those little tiny inner neurons in the limbic system. So that's why it's important. Now, these aren't the only molecules that play a role in this limbic system. And some of the uh, most interesting work has been done on opioids. We identify primarily opioids, these peptides in the brain, like the endorphins, as helping relieve pain, physical pain. So they're found in areas of the brain that are going to regulate the transmission of pain information. Interestingly enough, and people were initially surprised at this, opioids are also found in high concentration in limbic system structures. And it's now believed that they actually play a role in the diminution of emotional pain. And emotional pain and physical pain for human beings are related to each other. And so these opioids may actually play a role in helping to decrease emotional pain that individuals experience. Limbic system nuclei also some of them, a few of them, have a very high concentration of oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone. It's known as the love molecule. And uh, there's a reason why it's called that. For one thing, it does happen to be one of the targets of drugs like ecstasy. So young people feel bonded to each other when they take a drug that increases oxytocin because it makes them feel bonded. Oxytocin is found in very high concentrations in limbic system areas, specific limbic system areas, in animals that socially bond. And most of the research in this area has been done on that cute little mouse-like creature called the prairie vole. And the prairie vole is an interesting little animal. He's one of the very few animal species on the face of the planet that's truly monogamous. And it turns out that little prairie voles have a very high concentration of oxytocin in particular limbic system structures that we believe plays a critical role in their bonding to a mate for life. If you block the receptors for oxytocin in their brain, 
they no longer mate for life and they become promiscuous. And if you look across species, the more monogamous the species, the higher the oxytocin and the greater the number of receptors for binding oxytocin in the brain. Now, one of the reasons this is interesting is because oxytocin is a hormone and it plays a role, for example, in physiological processes like milk let down after a woman's given birth. So we used to think that one of the reasons why women bonded to a baby is because they nursed the baby. And, you know, here oxytocin's flowing and, and the woman held the baby and this led to it. In fact, oxytocin is released in very large quantities when we interact socially with each other. When, in fact, we socially interact like with a baby or with pets, when we have sexual intercourse, oxytocin levels go up. And this is believed in social species to play a role in the bonding that's necessary for survival of our species. And it's seen in species in which this is important. Now, to, just to give you a little idea, here's a picture where you can just see the oxytocin flying. Um, this is... Heine Studmuffin and his main squeeze, Buttercup. And you can just see the oxytocin uh, flowing in their brains. Now, the limbic system is this huge system that's involved in learning, memory, emotion, and executive function. And it is the system which is going to give us largely what we refer to as mood and temperament. So let's see how, how do physicians or how do psychiatrists separate these two things. Mood is an emotional response that fluctuates. So for example, if you don't get any sleep and your mood changes. So your mood fluctuates depending on context, depending on what's happening in your life. And mood can change just like that. Have you ever been like in a conversation with someone and you misunderstand something they say and immediately you feel angry? Well, part of that's because the mood can change very rapidly. Temperament is something different. Temperament is a very stable part of an individual and we now believe has to do really with how your limbic system is wired. And it's a fairly stable characteristic. So you have people that are highly reactive you have people who are sanguine by nature. You have people that have like different ways of engaging in the world. That's what the system does. It allows us to engage with the world. And we engage with the world with our unique limbic systems. Part may even be genetically transmitted. So you might notice a father and a son who have very similar personalities. Well, they may be raised together, but you often see children have personalities very different from their parents. So the way the genes combine and all the rest of this, we have some sort of genetically determined factors involved and then other things. And this is very active area of research because people's temperaments seem to be fairly stable parts of their personality. And we believe it's related, in fact, to how the uh, limbic system is wired in individuals. So I said that we have a system that if you throw off the balance, there's a lot of changes that take place. The way the person relates to the world changes. The way the person engages themselves in the world. All you have to do is think about an individual who suffers from serious depression. They withdraw from interactions with others. They don't want to eat. I mean, their whole way of engaging in the world changes. And so it's very obvious. And that involves just one neurotransmitter or can involve just one neurotransmitter in the limbic system, throwing off the balance of that one neurotransmitter, which we'll talk about um, in, our, in our lecture on depression. So the point being that changing the system changes how you feel. And another distinction that neuroscientists make is between an emotion and a feeling. So when we talk to each other in the general vernacular, we use these terms sort of loosely like they mean the same thing. You say, well, I feel angry, or, and you might say, that's the emotion that I'm having. Well, neuroscientists are taking a step back and trying to 
separate out components of this experience. And separating these definitions is one of the first steps in that. They see the emotion as a basic physiological state um, that has a lot to do with your autonomic nervous system and the changes that take place in your body as a result of this limbic system reaction to something. The feeling, however, and let's think about this, the feeling is that internal subjective state that you experience. So if I say to you, I'm depressed, you don't actually know exactly what I'm feeling. What you try to do is relate it to some state you've had before. So what we believe is that the limbic system, just like we saw in vision and audition, just like we've seen in all the other systems we've talked about, we believe what's happening in the limbic system is your cortex is actually constructing that internal subjective state. And in this case, it's a feeling. And in vision, for example, you have an internal subjective experience of color. Color isn't in the thing out there. And we saw that it could be taken away. And so we have this internal subjective sense of things. And for the limbic system, that is going to be our feelings. And so we attempt to describe our internal state to other people with words. And we think that this is one of the things that is, um, is important in talking about depression, as, as we will see later. Now, we've also learned that feedback from the body plays a role in the construction of this feeling. So a feeling is an active um, story, basically, that the brain concocts from the information that's taken in. It's a creative process that results in the subjective feeling. We know that feedback from the body is important, and we know this uh, because of a number of lines of evidence. One is something I mentioned before, and that was it was noticed that individuals who have transections to their spinal cord, very high transections of their spinal cord, seem to over time develop a different emotional response to the world. Their personality changes in some very fundamental ways. And initially it was concluded that that's just because they're depressed because of what's happened to them that anyone could understand. But we now believe that that's not true. Part of what the brain uses to construct feelings is feedback from the body. And these individuals are no longer getting the feedback from the body. And in fact, there's a decreased emotional response and also a decreased intensity to emotions that are experienced by long-term survivors of very high-level cervical uh, spinal cord damage. Now, the conclusion that the brain constructs our feelings or this internal subjective state is also evidenced by something else. And this was something that fascinated psychologists, fascinated people for a long time, philosophers too. And that is, many of the same physiological states are interpreted by us in a different way, depending on our experience, our expectations, the social context, whatever. For example, your heart beats hard if you're angry, but it beats hard if you're in ecstatic joy. So if you're feeling this incredible exuberance with life, then your heart also beats faster. So these body states, the brain just doesn't take it and then say, well, this feeling goes with that. It takes all these other things into consideration. The limbic system is this mega system involved in learning, memory, emotion, and executive function. And it takes the whole context. It takes your memory of past experiences and it interprets that increased heart rate in a particular way. It constructs the feeling and whether that feeling is positive or that feeling is negative. And you can actually do experiments where you can artificially stimulate the body sensation but lead people to think that an outcome of something will be positive or negative and they'll report having an internal positive or negative sensation even though the body sensation is exactly the same. So what we're going to see in our next lecture is that when you disrupt in normal individuals, when you disrupt this finely balanced system 
of all these nuclei that are involved in creating this internal subjective state that we call feeling something, regardless of what that feeling is, um, that you throw off this system. And we will use depression to be the example. And we will also talk about how it's treated and why certain antidepressants work. Thank you.